Hi there, I'm Jane Williams. In this week's podcast, I'll be interviewing Dr. Bridget Hare, who lectures in public health ethics and bioethics at UNSW. We'll be talking about some of the core concepts in public health ethics. This will reinforce your understanding of the readings and the lectures so far, and introduce some new examples that will help you think more laterally about the role of ethics in public health, and also to think about how public health operates as a moral enterprise. Hi, Bridget. Hello, Jane. Bridget, at this stage of the course, what are the key concepts for students? Well, public health ethics is concerned with ethical decision making in the social realm. So rather than being about the good or the best interest of the individual patients or research participants, it's all about populations and communities. Right, and populations and communities don't always have uniform ideas or shared values about what's good. That's right. And even when there are shared values, they might change over time in response to different pressures or different circumstances. Hmm. Can you give me some examples? Yeah, um, I'll give you two examples. One that's international and one that's very local. So the first one is voluntary HIV testing. Now, while there are some circumstances where HIV testing is mandatory, like if you want to immigrate to Australia, for example, International policy and national laws have generally respected the importance of individuals deciding voluntarily when or whether to have an HIV test. Huh, and why is that? It's because there's evidence of severe social harms occurring in some settings when people tested positive to HIV. So stigma and discrimination, but also violence, people being thrown out of their homes. And this was particularly evident, again, in some particular settings where women got diagnosed with HIV during pregnancy and then communicated this to their untested husbands. Uh, so the women were assumed to have brought HIV into the relationship? Yeah, that that's, was the theory. And despite the fact that they may very well have actually acquired the HIV from their husbands, their husbands weren't tested. Huh. And has that changed now? There are definitely more questions being asked about the relevance of what they call HIV exceptionalism, because now there are effective antiretroviral drugs that can reduce HIV in the body to where it gets to a point where it can't attack the immune system and can't infect a sexual partner. And global access is much better. So the argument is that everyone should get tested and put on treatment? Yeah, that's the public health argument now. And in a perfect world, it'd be a really persuasive one. But the problem is the stigma and discrimination still linger. And so the social harms that the strictly voluntary codes were designed around do still occur, I'm sorry to say. And the ethical solutions then involve working to combat HIV-related stigma at societal levels and advancing the rights of people with HIV so that a diagnosis doesn't impact on your rights and then continuing to promote the voluntary uptake of testing. Hmm, right. So what about that local example? Well. In Sydney, we have laws that get called the lockout laws. Um, these are laws that got adopted after two young people were killed in one punch attacks in entertainment districts within two years of each other. And this resulted in laws that closed um, premises early. The last, the last time that people could be let in was 1.30 a.m. and the last drinks were at 3 a.m. The goal of these laws was to reduce alcohol-related violence in Sydney's central entertainment districts. And there is real evidence that these worked. But five years after their introduction, following a review of the laws, the Premier announced that the laws will be removed in most areas of the central business district, with the exception of King's Cross. So that's, that's actually the area where the two young people got killed. Um, this change has been brought about by economic and social pressures. Um, businesses involved in the what they call the nighttime economy argued that they suffered, and various communities argued that the laws had a de detrimental effect on social life and also the reputation of Sydney as an international city. Hmm. What's going on with the change? Is, um, is the assumption that the problem with alcohol-related violence has gone? Not really. The news reports say that inner city hospital staff don't want the laws repealed. Um, the change appears to be all about a shift in values. So in 2014, when the Liquor Amendment Bill 2014 was introduced, it happened just after the second young person, um, his name was Daniel Christie, died after being assaulted outside a nightclub in King's Cross. So six years after that, 
that loss is no longer in the forefront of the public's mind and the economic and social costs of the restrictions are clearer. So ultimately, as the proximity of the two untimely deaths recede in both the public and, I would say, the political imagination, a shift in the weighting of values can be um, perceived. So other factors come to be valued more highly than the 2014 imperative to do something to reduce the alcohol-related violence and the tragic avoidable deaths. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, you've talked a lot about law here. How does the law issue relate to public health and public health ethics? As we've talked about in the lectures, there's a relationship between ethics and law. The outcome of the deliberative processes that involve ethical reasoning in public health are frequently then adopted as policies, regulations or laws. So in the case of the lockout laws, they impose barriers to alcohol-related violence by restricting and controlling access to venues and alcohol consumption within them, and the compliance was enforced. So these laws tackled and identified public health issue through legislation. And I would argue that it's the decision making around the issue where the public health ethics comes in um, about how serious the issue is, um, how do we rate the drop in alcohol related violence in comparison with the reduction of economic benefits for the nighttime economy. And the questions of are the laws proportionate and are they acceptable um, to the communities that they impact? And that's the kind of dialogue that's arguably resulted in the proposed changes. Oh, so different communities having different priorities or different ideas of what's good is one of the things that public health ethics wrestles with. Absolutely. And the principle of justice is very important. Justice, who's justice? And <laughs> who defines what's just? A good question. Um, as students will have learned in the social determinants lecture, social justice is critically important to public health ethics because when you effectively address the health issues for the worst off, that's where you get the biggest health gains. Uh, so are you saying that public health ethics skews towards egalitarianism? And um, that's at odds with old fashioned authoritarian public health practices like quarantine and isolation and other mandatory interventions, right? Yeah, you're right. Um, public health ethics is a relatively new field. So it's branched off from bioethics and considering how to reach aspirational goals like health for all within a context where there's both an understanding of the power of social determinants and an understanding that as a last resort, the state can use its coercive powers to compel obedience. Yeah, so that's the extreme end of public health powers. Um, but public health is mostly about very ordinary health measures rather than wild, terrifying pandemics that threaten life on Earth. Yeah, so public health ethics is often focused on how to balance a desirable health outcome for a population with how much interference in life choices for the communities deem acceptable. So what about the idea that public policies that constrain individuals supposedly for their own good produce a nanny state? Yeah, that is a really common criticism of public health interventions, like the lockout laws particularly. Um, another good example is the laws in New York that banned the sale of a particular mega-sized soft drink um, and laws in Australia that, um, that mandate bicycle helmets. Um, laws like this get criticised particularly by hardcore libertarians for imposing restrictions on individuals for their own good instead of giving them the liberty to make their own decisions and, you know, their own bad decisions. Yeah. Um, as, as you know, Jane, the mid-19th century philosopher John Stuart Mill is often invoked um, to support the idea that individuals should be able to make bad decisions if they want to. Um, and he authored the oft-cited harm principle, which states, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilised community against his will is to prevent harm to others. Mm -hmm. Now, you know that quote too, of yeah, course. Yeah. And I feel like the it's used a lot. Yes. Particularly, <laughs> I, I find in Australia the... the the kind of nanny state accusation is thrown around quite a lot and it occurs to me that it must be quite, um, I suppose, quite culturally or politically specific to some countries and not others. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, and, and the idea that of, you know, even what a nanny yeah. is as well. And I guess, um, yeah. yeah, it's culturally specific, isn't it? And so I guess like the really, the, the critical thing that, that Mill is saying and the reason that it gets mm. quoted mm. just, you know, so often, I think for, for a whole lot of people, it's the only yeah. John Stuart Mill they ever read in their whole um, lives. So it's like over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign which is the whole basis of, of liberalism as well as libertarianism. But there's kind of an interesting yeah. clash, I think, with public health there as well, because you've got the idea of, you know, I can do whatever I want, I can make my own bad decisions, leave me alone, but when it all goes horribly wrong, you're going to help me, right? You know? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. it's kind of a... It's like an interesting and not necessarily very coherent contrast, I think, quite a lot of the time. Yeah. Definitely. And I think oh, the other thing that I want to point out is that I think these days John Stuart Mill will be very, very embarrassed about the sexist language because he yeah, wasn't a he sexist. Was he was a, a fantastic, you know, feminist. Mm. He really was, yeah. But that language is still reflecting yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the syntax yeah. of the time, I guess, what formal language Of course was. we will. Um, obviously, <laughs> yeah. we will avoid okay. that in this course. Well, thanks, Bridget. We? Super interesting. <laughs> yeah. See so, ya. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Talk to you again soon. Bye.